Hello, and welcome back to another exciting episode of Refining Rhetoric. Today, Pastor Alan Mashburn is our guest. He is running for Lieutenant Governor here in my home state of North Carolina. Welcome to the show. Classical Conversation Studios presents Refining Rhetoric with CEO Robert Portens, a podcast where faith, business, politics, and classical education meet. Join us as we use the classical tools of rhetoric to seek truth in every arena of life. I'm excited to welcome a homeschool dad, my friend, and hopefully North Carolina's next lieutenant governor, Alan. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's an honor to be here, and it's certainly an honor to be endorsed by you, Robert. Thank you for all that you do. Uh, your your organization is known worldwide, and and we certainly appreciate every every facet that you do. Well, thank you so much, and Alan, I know you uh, are a fighter for the truth. You stand up for uh, everyone. You stand up for Jesus Christ. So, uh, just uh, real real proud to call you friend. I want to ask you, as a pastor, as someone who's running for office, how do you define truth? Well, unfortunately, you know, we live in a postmodernistic society that believes that uh, each person can have their own perceived truth. But truth is fact. Truth is reality. There's only one truth. There are many imitations, which are fallacies, they're falsehoods. But uh, truth literally can only be found in Jesus Christ, can only be found in the Word of God. So we must elevate that truth because truth dispels fallacy. And we're, we're reaping the not-so-called benefits of these fallacies that we're seeing today. Mm. Yeah, uh, reality tends to win out, and when you try to fight against it, uh, we see the negative outcomes that we see in our culture today from depression to different mental issues to, you know, I think only 30% of kids can read and write and do math at grade level. So uh, it's not a not a good outcome when you reject truth. Uh, your website says you're bold in your conviction that our country is only as good as our families. Can you uh, explain that for me? Well, the nuclear family, and I'm talking about one father, one mother, and then of course children, was created by God. And so it, it happens to be the only way to procreate and to remain as a population. So the destruction of the nuclear family is at the heart of um, most, if not all, of our problems that we're incurring as a nation and, and across the board in, in the world. So fathers have been absent uh, from the home, and it's, of course that's caused much grief in our society. And God holds men accountable for leadership in the home. So we must say that the, the men in America have failed much in leading their families to the bedrock of truth in our society. And when we, when we fail to have strong families, we fail to have a strong nation. So when you talk about national security threats, that is of utmost importance of a threat to our nation when we do not focus and empower the nuclear family. So that's our bold conviction that our country is only as good as our families, only as strong as our families. You've just made me realize we need to update that statement. <laughs> oh, amen. Well, uh, you're not alone. Uh, one of our founding fathers and our first president, George Washington, said in his farewell address, it is substantially true that virtue or morality is necessary springing of popular government that the only way to get that is, of course, through the family and through that family structure and why uh, so many of the left's ideas, I think, um, are at the destruction of the family, and you see the consequences of that. You know, one of the things that you hear in Christian circles is, oh, we need to stay out of politics, or, you know, Jesus doesn't have an opinion, or Jesus isn't Republican or Democrat, and of course, um, you know, some of that is true, uh, but I think uh, if you look at history, church leaders have been the ones on the forefront of leading for freedom uh, in not just the United States, but around the world. So what do you think uh, Christians' role should be in politics? Well, I don't think a Christian should ever have in their vocabulary or their mentality that we are not to be involved. Um, I think they're, they're, they're so worried, and, and I think what it boils down to is they're fearful of the word politics. Um, I grew up around people 
in in my home church that taught that Christians should never be involved in politics. Well, the Bible says we're to be called. We are called to be the salt and light of the world. Salt preserves. It protects from decay. Light dispels darkness. So we have so much rot in our nation because we have not been that salt. And we have built plenty of ministries, but we failed to encourage believers to be involved in the world in which we live. So the Christian's role should be engaged as a follower of Christ, holding that standard of truth high in the country. As a pastor, what uh, examples in the Bible have you seen of uh, biblical heroes getting involved in uh, local politics? Well, how much time do we have? Uh, in the Old sure. Testament, you have Just one or two. <laughs> In the Old Testament, you have Daniel, you have Joseph, you have Moses, you have Nehemiah, you have uh, uh, Esther, you have uh, Mordecai. And the prophets of the Old Testament were not shy about addressing the kings of Israel or uh, rulers of other nations. In the New Testament, you have John the Baptist, who was willing uh, to do whatever he was called to do. He was a forerunner of Christ, and he lost his head for Jesus, literally. It was delivered mm -hmm. to Herod on a platter. You have the Apostle Paul that both address the conduct of governmental officials and uh, in, in Romans 13 even provides seven verses to the place of God ordained government. So the word of God is filled with believers, followers of Christ, followers of God getting involved. So we cannot ever separate the two. Hmm. How can churches get involved uh, in politics or should they get involved in politics or what should it look like like, what is a preacher's responsibility uh, to speak into what's going on in the world around us? Well, churches can get involved by praying, obviously. But it's one thing to say you're praying and actually do the praying. First thing I would say is stop doing what I used to do, and that's praying at politicians or praying at leaders in government. Pray for them. Pray for their wisdom. Pray their, that God would put someone in their circle that would be a, a, an influence to them for God, for godly wisdom. But pray, you must pray. And, and I believe every time we pray, God creates an active uh, emotion inside of our very soul that causes us to want to be more engaged and more involved. So uh, this is where God speaks to you through his word. You speak to him through prayer, and, and God's going to show you things as you pray and communicate about government that you need to be involved as well. So uh, we must have our churches uh, you know, in America, we, uh, we say we go to church, but in reality, we are the church. And so we need to be the church outside the four walls of the church building. Uh, get out of the mentality that uh, the church should not be involved. You're in and of the world. And, uh, you're, well, let me rephrase that. You're not of the world. You're of Christ, but you're in the world. So you need to be engaged. Jesus said, occupy till I come. The word occupy there is pragmatia in Greek. And it literally means that uh, we are to settle in and be engaged and be involved in. So uh, I totally reject the idea that Christians shouldn't be involved. They should be involved. And there's so much work to be done. Now, I have people in my, my area of uh, my, my, my circle of ministry mm -hmm who say, well, we're called to win souls. Well, you are called to, to spread and promulgate the gospel. You're called to go. You're not called to stay. You're not called to stay in those four walls. You're called to go. And if you're so heavenly minded, you know earthly good, then you're not pleasing God anyway. But mm -hmm. the point is, if you're winning souls, I've traveled this state across, and we're going to uh, 100 counties. We've been to over half of them. Uh, I can tell you, we have churches not only in this state, but on, in this country on every corner. If we were doing everything in the church that we were supposed to do, we would not see the detriment of America that we're seeing. So don't give me the, the cock and bull story that you're, you're winning souls. No, you're not winning souls. If you were, then we would see a difference. We'd see a benefit from it. So let's just stop making the excuses and just get involved. Yeah, I a study that I read a few years ago said the average church saw 1.8 salvations a year. So uh, to your point, uh, if, if that's what they're focused on, uh, they're either incompetent or uh, not uh, headed in the right direction, unfortunately. Uh, what made you decide to run for office? Uh, lots of prayer, I'm sure, but uh, how do you go from the pulpit to politics? 
Well, I'm still pastoring. I have no intentions to to leave it as such, but um, you know, I started looking around and just praying how God would uh, lead me going forward. Uh, you think about segments of life in ministry. Um, I'm past the beginning. I'm past the probably the plateau, and um, I'm just looking at the next stages of my life. So when I came to this pastorate where I'm presently at. Uh, I was going to finish my doctorate, and I was just going to teach adjunct professor, uh, be an adjunct professor somewhere, and just write uh, theological papers the rest of my life. I love research, but uh, the more I started seeing everything, and I have children from ages nineteen to age four, uh, the more I started looking around and seeing what was going on. I said, "No, I can't do this. We have got to be involved. We've got to be engaged." Um, as you know, our current lieutenant governor and I are good friends, and. We started praying and started talking with him about how we could be effective, if anything, that God would want us to do. And um, so the Lord just laid this specific office on my heart, and we started praying and working toward it. And and I can take you back and show how God's connected all the dots for us. And um, so we are we're doing this to take a stand, raise the level of righteousness in our land, our state. And I'm running, I'm compelled to run because of my children. I want them to have a a future in this land. And the only way to do that is to have a common sense approach and real leadership from the top. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I do see research that shows that we might be coming upon the first generation that isn't going to live a better life than their forefathers. But of course, as you pointed out earlier, the family's kind of been eroded. And when you don't have strong families, it's not surprised that you don't have that ability to continue to move uh, the culture forward. And, you know, like you said, if the church, I often say, if the church would just do what God called the church to do, we wouldn't have all these problems. Your government could be as corrupt as you wanted it to be, or the world wants it to be, uh, but it wouldn't matter if Christians could just behave like Christians. Let me add one more thing, Robert. Um, Just... Uh, adding an appendage onto what you just said, civil government was established by God. So the very reason that we should be involved is because it is established by our king, by our God. So why shouldn't we be involved? That's the most compelling argument I've heard. Um, Obviously, I'm super involved, so I didn't need to be uh, convinced. But, you know, you do hear from people time to time, uh, not so much now with how crazy everything's gotten. The church is kind of waking up and saying, yeah, we do have to get involved. Maybe being uninvolved wasn't working uh, like we intended to. But you're right. It is something that God has ordained. And so, therefore, it is something that uh, Christians should be involved in. You mentioned earlier the idea of salt and light, which goes well with our practicum. Classical Conversations has one day homeschooling boot camps kind of during the summer we call practicum. And we actually talked about the salt trade in history uh, this year. So can you expand a little bit more on what you mean by salt and light uh, that you were touching on earlier? Well, as we said, salt preserves. It's a preserving agent. Uh, We may be past the part where our lives can be counted as salt in this nation. Um, because salt and light does two things, obviously. Salt preserves, light dispels the darkness. We have so much darkness and rot now, the salt being applied, because salt is aseptic, not antiseptic. Uh, It is not going to bring this country back just because us being salt. What is going to wake up and expose the, the darkness and the evil is us actually being the light. So the light... The, it, the job of the light is to invade the darkness. You turn on a light switch, the light comes on, the darkness dissipates. So the, the, the same teaching, the same uh, mentality goes along with that, transfers into our Christian walk. When we exhibit Christ in the public square, then that exposes the darkness. Now, our lives doesn't do that by itself, but the truth that God lives in us, the Holy Spirit, Uh, does that. So we have that ministry. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. We serve him. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And so we must do that as believers, agents of his kingdom, to be that light in a dark world. And uh, once we have done that, then of course we could have the ministry 
uh, of salt being that salt preserving what we have have uh, been able to dispel and bring back in the right track. Mm. Yeah, I hear many more commentators these days say, you know, we're getting closer to midnight on America, that that final hour. Uh, and as you said, salt preserves, but if Jesus Christ wants it, he can, he's the one who restores. Is that accurate? That's very accurate. It's not that we think the United States can't be saved, but we know there's only one person who can save it. Exactly. And, and we're not, as the leftists would say, I've been accused in the last few days because of some articles that we've put out uh, that has gone national about um, how immorality brings down and historically has brought down every nation. That right. when they when they loose everything on on immorality and allow themselves to go down that path, uh, their pinnacle has been passed. They they do not recover. So we do not seek to bring a theocracy. And my response to one leftist that sent me an email, you better be thankful we don't have a theocracy because you'd be dead because God would strike you dead. That's the punishment of sin. Uh, yeah. we, don't, we don't have that power, nor is that in our mindset. What we want to do is raise the level of righteousness for our next generation and uh, make sure that our republic lasts and we do not follow down the uh, the the historical map of those countries like uh, like the Greeks, the Romans, the Mongols, all of those countries that have lost their pinnacle and no longer exist the way they were, certainly because of what they have chosen. One of the important things is, to me, the Second Amendment. I say the Second Amendment protects the rest of them. Uh, tell us about your stance on the Second Amendment and gun rights, especially uh, here in North Carolina. Well, we are big Second Amendment fans. Uh, we certainly love our guns, and we love to go out and shoot our guns, and we love to, uh, we, well, we love guns. Uh, we're Second Amendment, and I totally agree with you. The Second Amendment protects all of those. Uh, I've heard it said that we have the First Amendment. We have the Second Amendment in case they forget we have the First Amendment. Uh, <laughs> you can say what you want to, but but uh, it, it's so important that we maintain that. You have to understand uh, there's a reason why the left wants to disarm America. And look at the nations in the world that have been disarmed. Um, the people are in servitude to the government. And so everybody who wants to disarm a, a legal citizen, a citizen that that is not going out committing crimes, is not going out uh, shooting up stores or committing robberies, why would you want to harm the rights of that type of person? I mean, I have guns, and I'm not going to tell you how many I've got or what I've got. That's my business. But I've never committed a crime with them. I don't have a, I don't have a idea or a desire to do that. So uh, uh, it's always been the formula of the left to hold the the gun accountable instead of the shooter. And of course, they would just want to eradicate every gun for everybody, and only them would have only they would have the guns. Yeah, that hasn't worked out too well for the populace uh, throughout history uh, at all. You know, one of the things that North Carolina had until recently uh, was the sheriff had to approve your purchase of a pistol, uh, which actually came out, I think, uh, from them trying to prohibit or make it more difficult for African Americans or other minorities to own guns in North Carolina. The Republican uh, got that passed. Was that vetoed by the Democrat uh Governor, yes, in North Carolina, yeah. So Democrats, of course, vetoed that, uh, and now uh, I think we were able to override his veto. Uh, but we don't have uh, what is it called permitless carry here in the United or here in North Carolina. Uh, how do you feel about permitless carry, otherwise known as constitutional Second Amendment? Carry. Yeah. Um, well, I'm certainly in favor of of the right to, uh, to, to do that. I know we were, we were going to see that in the very short future, hopefully with the uh, legislature that we have. Um, but, uh, there's always going to be some, some concerns by some various other ones, but a lot of it has to do with, they need to understand what that really means. It, uh, stop listening to the left and start realizing that, that, uh, 
it falls completely in line of the right under the Second Amendment for us to carry our firearms to protect ourselves. And there has never been a time greater than right now to do that. So I have been, we put out a statement when that uh, came up uh, and uh, we hold to it and we stand up for it. Now, one thing I am going to say that this will not be too popular with a lot of people because they think, they think when you say something and uh, putting a condition on something, uh, you're against it. What I am for is for each gun owner to be educated. And uh, I don't need a state law for that. But what I would encourage uh, fathers and parents to do is if you're going to take your children out and educate them to shoot, you need to educate them on gun safety. Uh, because anything the left does out here, anything the left uh, does, they're going to make sure that they take care of the safety issue and make that their biggest, their biggest hoopla to hold against us. But the primary reason is we need to teach our young people, our children, how to handle firearms uh, because we want to make sure that they're safe and be above reproach from the other side. So I'm all for the educational factor of it. Uh, but we need to never, ever give an inch. We've got a graphic I think we put up every now and then, zero compromise on the Second Amendment. We will never compromise that at all. Hi, everyone. I am so excited to tell you about Scribblers at Home, recipes from lifelong learners. This is our all new at home resource for homeschool families of four to eight year olds. If you've been looking to create a family environment where learning is playful, creative and natural, you are absolutely going to love Scribblers at Home. Getting started with Scribblers is easy. It's super easy. As an at-home resource, this book makes use of everyday materials and settings around your house. Transforming your kitchen into a laboratory or your backyard into an observatory. Speaking of kitchens, the structure of Scribblers mimics a cookbook and each of these recipes lays out a step-by-step -step and engaging activity to do with your child that will help them develop learning habits at an early age. Scribblers was created by a team of lifelong learners here at Classical Conversations, and they've discovered a thing or two from homeschooling their own kids. Each of these recipes condenses their years of knowledge and experience into simple steps that anyone can follow. Let them guide you and your child into becoming lifelong learners too. Finally, we know that life with small children can get pretty crazy sometimes. And so Scribblers gives your family enough structure, but also the freedom to follow along at your own pace. If you need to, you can customize, skip, or complete the activities out of order. No problem. Through intentional play, Scribblers at Home, recipes from lifelong learners will help you inspire your child to build strong learning habits early on. And they'll carry these skills with them through a lifetime of learning. You know, to your point of education, you know, that's something that we did uh, through Trail Life, uh, not an official Trail Life. Uh, function, but uh, some of the fathers got together uh, and did a shooting class with our kids with, uh, you know, non-lethal weapons. Uh, and then our church is actually, uh, we have some uh, members that have a lot of land. And so we've scheduled some time to go uh, do gun safety uh, with any of the young people who are, are wanting to do it. So it's it's always our responsibility. And if you have freedom, then you have the responsibility to um, with great freedom act comes within. great responsibility. Yeah, amen to that. Now, you always hear about, you know, mass shootings, which are very, very rare in the U.S., but why doesn't the media cover the times when a mass shooting was stopped by a legal gun owner? Because it doesn't fit the narrative. It doesn't fit the narrative of of uh, the the. the the fact that guns are the cause, that's their narrative. If we got rid of guns, we would never have any shootings. Well, that's like saying if you got rid of spoons, you'd never have any fat people. Um, that's, that's a straw argument. And, and it's one that only fits their narrative, so they're going to use it. And the sad thing is they have done, a, they've done such a good job. The left has done such a great job at dumbing down our public 
and dumbing down education, that there are people out there who actually follow that narrative. Mm-hmm. Well, that was the funny thing because Moms for Liberty has been getting up a lot of flack on Twitter and uh, by the left because they said, hey, our students need to read Mao. They need to read Hitler. They need to read these guys, um, historical bad guys and what they believed. And the left's been pushing back on that. Why do you think the left pushes back on reading uh, what these individuals believed and what type of government they wanted to enact in their countries? Because they want to erase history. They don't want you to learn that that those uh, that Hitler or anyone else that that may be mentioned uh, was a detriment to society. They want you to believe, and and everyone who's in the public educational system to believe that these were successes. Well, if they were successes, why, why did they fail? Uh, we do not uh, need to read them as glory, as glory, glory, hallelujah guys carrying around. No, we need to learn how and why they failed and why they were evil. Uh, that part we may never know, but the fact that they were evil and the detriment on society. So uh, yeah, we need to learn about them. I learned about them in school and I came away walking away from learning about Hitler and, and Mussolini and all them and, and seeing the detriment that they were to the culture, uh, to human beings and how many people that they murdered. Yeah, the one thing they had all in common was they eliminated gun ownership for their citizens as one of the early, early Bingo. things. Bingo. You nailed it. And propaganda. Yep. Yeah, they owned the media. They owned the media. Uh, every time we can save a life uh, from abortion, I am uh, excited. Of course, I would love to see zero abortions in our country, and I know that with the fall of Dobbs, we've started moving in that direction. Uh, North Carolina just passed a law that I don't think limits it enough, but it limits it more than it w- was in the past. So uh, pro-lifers had one big fight, and that was Dobbs. We won that fight. Uh, but now it seems we have 50 skirmishes, uh, one in each uh, capital in the United States. So how do you encourage uh, pro-lifers who spent 50 years uh, fighting the big monster to now uh, continue that fight and take more la- land, more more space, and not just uh, to save lives, but really to change the hearts of fathers, which I think is the root cause of abortion in our country? Well, I was the only lieutenant governor candidate that came out and demanded a total ban. Um, And I came out the strongest and the hardest on that decision. It is a definitely a win that Dobbs came down the way it did. Um, But the work is not done. We called for a total ban. Nevertheless, we have a 12 week ban. The battle is not over. Now I'm not talking about lowering it any more incrementally. Now we'd want that. We want a total ban, but here's what I'm saying. The left will always want to raise that ban. They want to do away with that. The 20 Mm -hmm. week, they, it, it it was palatable to them. Uh, but the 12 week is they're acting like, you know, they just lost their toothbrush and they don't have any teeth, but (laughs) this this could easily change if we have a shift in the legislature. So we have got to be ever more on guard and strengthened in our resolve because the abortion issue is not going away. Uh, This fire has been stoked just because the ban has gone from 20 to 12 would be the same way. If it went from 20 to a total ban, Uh, they would be more in infested with anger. Uh, so the left will forever make this an issue. And if they ever do, uh, gain power of the legislature, they will make sure that they turn this a red state. And I'm not talking about a red Republican. I'm talking about a red state with the blood of murdered children. Uh, mm-hmm. we can't ever allow that to happen. We need everyone on board to strengthen our resolve in this and say enough is enough. We're never going to allow this to happen again, not on our watch. And we will stand strong and stand tall. You know, abortion, if you don't respect an individual's right to life, you can't really respect any of their other rights. And you always hear uh, the left saying, oh, it's our right to do this. It's our right to do that. Uh, do you have the right to, to infringe on someone else's life? No. 
No, you don't. You don't have the biblical right. You certainly don't have the constitutional right. Mm. What can the church do? Um, you know, you mentioned earlier that the churches aren't necessarily doing all that they could be doing. So what can the church be doing now to, even though the ban or the legislators aren't where we want them to, to be today, but what could we do as a church to make it so that there's no abortions going on in the state, no matter what the law is? Well, let's start at the very beginning. Uh, according to Barna Research, I believe it is, in 2020, uh, hardly any evangelical churches, uh, individuals voted from our evangelical churches. Uh, so number one, we've got to be engaged with our society. We've got to be engaged with what's going on. We need to have voter drives in every church, which is completely legal. Nobody should be sitting in our pews that that is not registered to vote. They need to see that their vote belongs to God and everything we do must to bring glory to him. It is biblical for you to vote and it is biblical for you to vote in accordance to biblical convictions and principles. And then we must be on the bandwagon of getting believers, Christians, people who are principled, people who are wise, people who are mature in their faith, involved and running for office. If we want to keep this state and country the where it is and where it needs to be and go even farther in restricting the knife, the butcher's knife on a baby's life, then we need to make sure that we get the right people in office. Uh, it is an ongoing f battle. It is an ongoing fight. Light does never, it, it never turns off. It must always invade the darkness. We must get out of the mentality of enjoying our materialism that we have worked for, and that's perfectly fine. I'm not saying that no one should take a vacation. I'm simply saying that we have got to get off of our blessed assurance and start standing up for what we know to be right and be engaged. 2024 is going to be one of the most, if not the most, important election. And you're going to hear that from everybody but it's going to be so important. If we lose or give an inch in 2024, I do not believe we're going to be able to recover. So we have got to get everyone on board to take a stand for what is right and be principled in their resolve. Hmm. Now, I always uh, like to hear from candidates on uh, running. Like, What are some of the things that you've learned running for office that you weren't expecting uh, when you first uh, raised your hand and said, uh, here I am, Lord, send me. Well, I've been in ministry about 30 years, um, back 31 years this year. Um, I never knew real spiritual battle until I got into this. And I thought I did as a pastor. I thought as a pastor, I've seen, I've seen most everything. Uh, but I'll tell you, I've never knew the real extent of spiritual warfare. Political solutions, they are not going to solve our problems. We have a spiritual problem. We have a heart problem. This is spiritual warfare. And uh, that's the thing that I knew about, but I had never experienced. And uh, a after having been in this for a few months, um, I was warned that that, was be that would be the case by our current lieutenant governor. He said, when he was inaugurated, he said, I thought I had run for a position, but now I know I'm in spiritual battle. And uh, it, it's where uh, it, it's where Satan, Satan is in the details of this. And he would like nothing better to bring down the United States as a country because we have been blessed by God, I say, far better than any country in the world. Uh, even, I'll put that up against Israel in many regards. But um, Satan would love to bring us down. He, he attacks our families. He attacks our minds. Um, so uh, it, it's been a tough road spiritually in this uh, because the battle has been very, very real. Yeah. Why do you think Satan chooses that arena? It seems like that's the arena he's chosen to battle in right now. I mean, we're all in a spiritual battle, but sometimes it feels like you might be on the sideline or that's somewhere else, especially from our own comfort, our own blessed assurance that we can sit on here in the United States where we've got our grocery stores full and electricity uh, running into the house uh, without any problems. 
Uh, why do you think the devil has chosen that battleground to really uh, make himself known, it seems like? Well, I think it goes back to uh, destroying the, the fabric and the fiber of the nation. Uh, if he can do that through the leadership roles and and politically that's the medium in which we have in this country that that leads the the country um it, it's just the best way for him to do that i don't know if you've ever heard paul harvey say if uh, read off or, or recite if i were the devil uh he he shows a lot of insight in that beyond his beyond his time really of how satan really gets into the metrics the bearings the tumblers of america and it's because we have been negligent in sending and penetrating those areas with the light of the gospel, with the light of godliness, with the light of Christian witness. And when Christian witness is absent, Satan just has a ball. He has a ball game, and that's what he's done. And he's the prince of the power of the air, and he's made it his turf. Now, in North Carolina, our lieutenant governors run separate from our governors, and of course, we got the primaries going on. But you mentioned your friend Mark Robinson, our current lieutenant governor, uh, running for governor, and I'm uh, cheerleading him on and would be excited to see him win. I would love to see you win as well. Uh, what type of team would you all be able to make uh, being so uh, having such a long relationship uh, and uh, what would that look like in Raleigh for us Christians here in uh, North Carolina? Well, Lieutenant Governor Robinson, of course, has made it uh, very clear that he plans to focus on education and the economy. I think they go hand in hand. Um, I've been involved in both homeschooling and homeschooling our children, graduate degree, uh, graduate studies and teaching uh, seminary level theology. My wife's an educator. She taught public, private and homeschool settings. I've been a business owner myself. He's been a business owner. We know the struggles of working family. I'm a pastor. Much of that time was done as a bivocational pastor. Hey, we're ordinary people. So we know what the average American and the average North Carolinian goes through. I was a welder for 12 years, a business owner about the same amount of time. Mark will be in Raleigh governing, and I'll be out in the state, of, out and about uh, speaking to people asking them questions, taking my fact finding back to the governor's mansion. And, and of course, I want to make the disclaimer. I do not speak for the Mark Robinson campaign. I'm just saying this on part of a friend and, and how we uh, are, are work, how we work good together. We are good friends. I have no doubt that he'll set an agenda. His administration will set policy in motion and I'll help him as much as, as I can. Uh, again, we're not a running mate style state. And he won't be my boss. The people will, because the people will have elected me. But rest assured, I'm committed to helping him succeed. And I'm committed to seeing our state excel. And the best way to see North Carolina thrive is to get government out of the way and let the private sector, let the people grow the economy. And the mighty appetite of the government must be curtailed. And I'll be glad to help with that. And uh, you are running in a primary. There's other people running. Have you chosen to run a positive campaign? Have you seen some dirty tactics? Or how are you distinguishing yourself? And what are you seeing from uh, those other individual running when you're probably aligned on 80, 90% of the same uh, agenda? Well, we're certainly not running a negative campaign uh, that won't get us anywhere. We've chosen to be positive. I'm not running against any of, of my opponents. I'm running for lieutenant governor. I'm not running, uh, 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 seeing what they're doing. I could, uh, and I hope they'll take this in the right manner. I could care, couldn't care less what they're doing. I want to focus on our campaign. I feel strongly about what we're doing and why we're running. We're running for the right reasons. We're not career politicians. I'm not looking for a new career change. I am wanting to make a difference for my children and I'm wanting to make a difference for the next generation. So that's our premise. That's our platform. We want to uh, come out strong. We want to present ourselves strong. Our tagline is be bold. And the reason why we chose that is because the left is not lacking on putting 
putting all of their garbage and their filth and their delusion right in our faces. And we know what is right. We hold to family values. We believe in a patriotic American, America. We believe that our children are our most important resource in this state. And so we know we're right, running for the right reasons. And uh, a negative campaign is nothing that we want any part of. Mm. Now, I just want to talk about uh, your being a pastor. Why do you think being a pastor has prepared you uh, to be in Raleigh? Well, if you can endure a church business meeting, you can endure the legislature. <laughs> um, so it, it certainly has allowed me to see uh, a lot of different aspects of how people uh, have it through their lives. I've been in um, churches that are large. I've been in churches that are, are, are small. And, and uh, no matter where you go, people have problems. And we need to learn that government is not the caretaker. Government is not the answer to our problems. It's not the solution to anything. But government should be to protect the people, protect the people from, from hardship, from scams, from anything that would harm their way of life. And as a pastor, you're almost as a shepherd because you're, you're akin to that in the scripture, an under shepherd with the Lord. And so you look out for people. And I think that's something that we're, making, you're, we're missing and we're lacking in, in uh, a servant leadership role in our government. I detest the word politician because we elect servants. And if we had servants, we would not have the self-serving government that we have that would continue ballooning in growth, but it would be a servant to the people. So uh, we have got to get everything under control and remember that we, the people, must be the people and serve the people. Amen. Well, Alan, thanks so much for coming on today. What's your website? Uh, how can people connect with you on social media so if they want to learn more, if they want to donate either finances or time to the campaign? Uh, how can they get a hold of you? Well, you can do all of that through our website. It's very simple. www.allen, A-L-L-E-N, for the number four, nc.com. Allen for nc.com. Go there. You can sign up to see receive our updates. You can sign up to volunteer and you can give through the website as well. Our handles on uh, Facebook and Twitter are Mashburn for NC. And uh, I believe on Instagram, uh, I have someone else handling this for me, <laughs> but Instagram is uh, young conservatives for Allen Mashburn. Uh, on there. So uh, you can follow us on all mediums and I trust you will. All right. Thank you, Alan. And yeah, go to visit alan4nc.com and uh, go check out his campaign and I will be praying for you and uh, rooting for you as uh, you get through this uh, primary season. Thank you, sir. It's always a joy to talk with you. I appreciate everything you and your organization does. And uh, it's an honor to be on your podcast everyone. I hope you enjoyed today's show. I was really encouraged by the idea of making sure everyone in your church is registered to vote. That is something actionable you can do. Uh, you can also share our show today uh, with a friend or with someone in ministry and be sure to be praying for our elected officials. Until next time, keep practicing all the tools of learning. Thank you for listening to Refining Rhetoric with Robert Bordens. Want more? Make sure to subscribe so you won't miss an episode. You can also follow us on social media to continue the conversation and visit classicalconversations.com forward slash rhetoric to find out how you can join a local homeschool community.